good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, um, and a very warm welcome to all of you to this sixth C.R. Parikh Memorial Lecture by Professor Tim Lubin. Um, I'll say a few words about the Institute before asking uh, Kum Kum Roy, uh, one of the preeminent historians of ancient India, and until recently, Professor at JNU, to preside over this lecture. The Parik Institute was set up with an endowment from the Nirman Foundation. Uh, this foundation uh, was launched by Professor Bhikkhu Parikh, uh, the eminent uh, political philosopher, and his brother, Chandrakant, Chandrakant Bhai, in honor of their father. The objective of the Parik Institute is to study the past and present moral, social, and political thought of India, and to share its deliberations widely through workshops, conferences, lectures, and publications. Our focus is on thought and on the history of thought in the widest possible sense. So we study Indian intellectual traditions, uh, we study major and but neglected thinkers, history of concepts, explorations of transitions from one kind of intellectual world or social imaginary to another, all of this within uh, the subcontinent um, or South Asia or India. Uh, this purpose, which structures all its activities, remains its focus. The Institute chooses an appropriate theme each year and invites scholars to work on that theme uh, to interact on it with scholars inside and a few uh, scholars from outside the center. These sessions are very intensive, very intimate, and uh, uh, they are sustained over a period of months uh, or a, a little more. Uh, and and they've been, uh, we've been working like this uh, uh, since 2015. Uh, in the first uh, year, that is 2015, uh, we had uh, professors Patrick Oliver, uh, Tim Lubin, who's with us uh, today as well, and uh, Mark McLeish, uh, all of them uh, who led uh, reading, reading discussions on the Manav Dharma Shastra, the Artha Shastra, and the Ashokan inscriptions. And that year, the, the, the first C.R. Parik Memorial Lecture uh, was uh, uh, given by Professor Patrick Oliver. In 2016, the Institute invited uh, uh, three uh, eminent scholars, uh, Professor uh, Chris Minkowski, Professor Larry McRae, and Ajay Rao. Uh, and that year, we our focus was on exclusion and marginality, and we read the Sabarabhashya, uh, we had selections from the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. Uh, and uh, we also organized a workshop uh, uh, on the rise of Vedanta. Uh, that year, uh, Professor Christopher Minkowski delivered the second C.R. Parik Memorial Lecture. Likewise, in 2017, uh, we, had, we had more than three scholars. We had about seven scholars, uh, three from the... From, uh, from uh, who were specialists on ancient Indian thought and the other four on ancient Chinese thought. And this uh, we were able to do thanks to a collaboration with the Bagruan Institute. So we had Roger Ames, Chen, Lee Chen Young, uh, Daniel Bell, Patrick Oliver, Donald Davis, and Jean Schleiter. Um, and uh, we also held a major workshop uh, on the ends of human life, which was a comparative study of ancient and Chinese traditions. Uh, and uh, uh, the proceedings of that uh, workshop uh, uh, will be coming out as a volume edited by uh, Roger Ames and myself. Uh, that year, uh, the, the Parikh Memorial Lecture was given by Yigal, sorry, uh, by, by Professor David Wong. In 2018, we hosted uh, Another set of scholars, uh, Professor Shulman, David Shulman, Yigal Brauner, Keshavan Pelutat, Gary Tubb, and Andrew Ollett. Uh, and the texts chosen were from Kerala and included the Nairayanam, the uh, Natankusha, and the, and the Ramayana Prabandhanam. 
uh, and that year the lecture, the Parik Memorial Lecture was given by Yigal Bronner on Dundin's aesthetics. In 2019, uh, Patrick Oliver agreed to come again uh, and we had, he, he led sessions from the uh, Dharam Sutras and the Dharma Shastras. Um, and a, a second session was led by Professor Johannes Bronkos of the University of Los Lausanne, uh, who worked with us on three of his pathway breaking works on the relationship between Brahmanism and Buddhism in early India. Uh, and that lecture was, uh, that year the lecture was given by Professor Bronkos. After that, there was uh, two, there were two years when uh, we, we, we couldn't have these intensive reading sessions because of COVID, but we still managed to have an online workshop on uh, uh, the textual life of caste. Uh, the second uh, 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 ver second advanced version of which uh, will take place from tomorrow, uh, uh, and it will be held over three days. This is a hybrid conference, uh, and in uh, in in a in seven or eight months from now, we once again have three eminent scholars coming, hopefully uh, uh, to be present physically with us to to uh, do uh, some more intensive readings. Uh, so with that uh, rather long uh, introduction to the work that we've been doing, I now hand over uh, uh, the mic to uh, Professor Kumkum Kum Rao, who will now chair uh, this lecture. Kumkum. Kum. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be present here this evening with all of you. And uh, I'm looking forward to listening to uh, Professor T Timothy Lubin, who has worked extensively on Sanskrit texts with the focus on religious and legal history and their traditions and the interaction amongst them. And today he will be talking and sharing his insights on the religious endowments of the first millennium of the common era and the extent to which they uh, worked towards consolidating a certain kind of Brahmanical identity. With these words, over to you, Professor Lubin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's all, it's very, I, I feel it's a great honor uh, for, uh, to be invited to, uh, to present to you. Uh, I'm very sorry that uh, I'm not able to be there in person. Uh, I have such fond memories of uh, that month or so that uh, uh, I spent with you in 2015, and it would be uh, lovely to have been able to, uh, to share this with you face to face. But be that as it may, uh, let's proceed. Uh, I do have a uh, PowerPoint show. Um, which I will share with you. If you just give me one moment. All right. <clears throat> so uh, let me begin. Around the middle of the first millennium of the, uh, the first century of the common era, uh, King Nahapana Chaharata, a Central Asian Scythian, who had established a small kingdom in Western India, captured some territory to the south belonging to the Satavahanas. Soon after, his son-in-law, Ushavadatta, made religious benefactions at two sites where monastic residences were excavated in the cliff sides, at Karle and Nasik in Maharashtra. In his inscriptions there, he spoke of giving patronage not only to Buddhist monks in the caves, but also to communities of Brahmins, the priestly caste that was one of the Buddhist's rivals for royal patronage. At Karle, Ushavadatta recorded his gift of a village to support Buddhist monks spending the rainy season in their caves. At Nasik, he purchases fields for 400 Karshapanas from a Brahmin and donates it to provide food for the Buddhist monks living in the caves there. These are the oldest surviving examples of charters recording a land grant uh, as endowment to a religious group, a genre of document that would become increasingly common and vastly more elaborate over the centuries. 
that these are evidently not the first instances of such an endowment, since both at Nasik and at Karle, he mentions having earlier given 16 villages to Brahmins, besides 300 head of cattle, gold, eight wives, and uh, as well as feeding them annually, feeding the Brahmins annually. Another interesting feature is that the eulogy of the donor at Karle and, the, and at Nasik are parallel, but the Nasik version has been expanded and recast in the Brahmin's liturgical language, Sanskrit, rather than the Prakrit or Middle Indic nor, normally used at that time for inscriptions. At Nasik, he is called Dharmaatma, pious or Dharma-minded. <clears throat> And here's a uh, image of his father-in-law, Nahapana, uh, uh, at Cave 10, uh, and an image of Cave 10. Another long inscription at uh, Nasik Cave 10 uh, records some complex financial arrangements. Having created a cave residence designed to accommodate 20 monks, Ushavadatta additionally established a perpetual endowment with capital of 3,000 silver coins, invested with two guilds of weavers at stipulated interest rates, the interest sufficient, the income sufficient to keep each of the monks supplied with robes and other necessities. An addendum dated three years later notes, almost in passing, a much larger earlier gift of 70,000 silver coins, uh, which he then equates with 2,000 in gold to quote unquote, gods and Brahmins. It's, a, it's striking that, again, this portion is of, the, of the record is more Sanskritized than the rest. <clears throat> a year or so later, the Satavahanas reclaimed their lost territory reasserting his sovereignty through public acts of benefaction around the year 78, Gautami Putra Satakarni decreed his own grants of agricultural land to Buddhist monks at Karle and Nasik. Again, the immediate aim of these grants was to provide financial support for the monks. The share of revenue from the land that would otherwise have gone to the king was redirected uh, uh, to, for their support. In this case, as part of the arrangement, the fields were stipulated to be likewise exempted from a list of otherwise normal obligations to the king. At Nasik, the king issued uh, the order that certain lands be made over to the monks and be that the terms uh, be duly recorded in a document, an order that was in turn recopied in durable form as an inscription on the rock. His Karle endowment had similar stipulations. Gautami Putra Satakarni's grants <clears throat> speak of legal immunities, such as uh, exemption pertaining to a field, Keta Saparihara, and exemptions pertaining to monks' plowlands, Bhikkuhala Parihara. Such endowed properties are elsewhere in these records called Deya Dharma or uh, in, in, in Kashmir, uh, in Kashmir, Deva Dhamma, Dhamma Dena Lena, uh, a cave that is a pious gift, a cave that is a bridge of Dharma, uh, Dharma Setu Lena, or Dana Grama, a gift village. They, re they represent a regularized practice with precedence in the inscriptions of uh, the Emperor Ashoka Maurya three centuries later. Um, I'm sorry, three centuries earlier. More throughout his edicts, Ashoka, influenced by Buddhist teachings, praised the importance of Dharma as personal virtue and civic duty, appointing officers to propagate it in his realms and to oversee religious groups. He often mentioned giving dana to ascetics and Brahmins as a virtuous practice, which he himself modeled by bestowing rock cut cave residences for ascetics in the Barabar Hills. Inscriptions record that each cave was given, quote, by King Piyadasi to the Ajivikas. Three caves in the nearby Nagarjuni Hills were bestowed by his son Dasharatha. These gifts were declared to be valid, quote, unquote, for as long as the moon and sun, Achandasulian. 
that is, in perpetuity. A formulation used earlier by Ashoka about his decrees in general. The, the documentary function of these cave dedications is made evident by the fact that an effort was later made to efface the word ajivakehi, meaning to the ajivakas, a falsification of this property deed no doubt perpetrated by members of a rival sect. These earliest grant records were extremely simple, lacking those features of the Kshaharata and Satavahana inscriptions that refer to financial and fiscal arrangements or explicitly defined property rights. Those features constitute those records as religious foundation grants. That is to say, grants that are a bundle of special privileges attached to a piece of property and conferred upon a beneficiary as recorded in and put into effect by a document, and thus what we call a charter. The beneficiaries were members of a re religious profession, though sometimes the gift was made in the name of a deity or of the Buddha. These foundations uh, and the stipulated privileges could include exemption from, as we saw in, the early, uh, in this slide, uh, exemption from payment of certain taxes or levies and other obligations to civil authorities, including billeting of officials or supply of obligatory labor. Immunity to interference by civil authorities and widespread and wide uh, juridical autonomy, the right to handle and resolve legal disputes. Uh, or at least to levy and collect fines. Most of the earliest surviving grant records were for ordained mendicants of the Buddhist, Jain, and Ajivika traditions. But as we've seen, Brahmanas are referred to as receiving gifts, including land grants, and endowments for Brahmins eventually came to predominate. This institution has strikingly close analogs in medieval Europe from the British Isles to Constantinople, where uh, in, the, in the medieval period, uh, where beneficiaries were uh, most often Christian churches or monasteries. I'll return to this analogy at the end of my talk. So these Indian endowments raise interesting questions about their social implications and political effects. What are the potential and actual consequences of giving public or state recognition to religious groups in this way. At the end of the talk, I'll consider the uh, implication of the fact that unlike other groups who received such support, the Brahmin beneficiaries belong to a social group in which membership was conferred by birth rather than through ordination in a monastic or priestly profession. Yet the charters give, give as justification for the grants, the sacred status and professional religious qualifications of the groups so endowed. The, official, the foundation charter thereby becomes a legal instrument that endorsed a social group's claim to intrinsic social sta sacred status and provided institutional support and state endorsement uh, that would other, for a status that would otherwise have to rely on the persuasive force of scriptural tradition and its exponents. From the Satavahanas onward, endowments were often set up according to a rule of Akshaya Niwi. Uh, Akshaya Niwi meaning non-decreasing principle or permanent endowment, which applied either to donated land, which should be retained to generate in agricultural revenue, or to other forms of capital uh, invested to generate interest income. The former type is the object of the oldest surviving copper plate charter in India, the Patagandi Gudam plates of the second half of the third century, which record the gift of a Shalankaya king of plow land that is made to provide revenue for monks. Hello, Baku Bhogam, by the terms of a permanent endowment. Most such endowments, as at Patagandi Gudam, were conferred upon a Buddhist monastic group. And Gregory Chopin has discussed scriptural accounts that depict the Buddha as endorsing this practice of in investing in endowment capital as a means of funding monastic life. Indeed, Chopin argues that the arrangement probably uh, was, the, was first used to support Buddhist groups. 
only thereafter being employed to fund Brahmin enclaves and temples. Yet there are also a few instances of Brahmins as beneficiary of a permanent endowment, either directly or in the name of a Brahmanical deity, such as the case of a pillar inscription from the reign of the same king <clears throat> at, the site, at the Buddhist site at Nagarjuna Konda, but dedicated to a, the, to a temple of a deity, the, the sanctuary of a deity called Pushpapadra Swami. Here again, the use of Sanskrit rather than of Middle Indic in the record is a signal that the temple was in Brahmin hands. The next century saw an increase in Brahmins receiving property endowments like those given to Buddhists. The surviving Satavahana donations include the Malavali uh, pillar inscription of uh, Chutukulananda uh, Satakarni in Karnataka, which records a late third century Brahmin endowment and the word now appears for the first time, Bhammadeja or Brahmadeja in Sanskrit, in favor of a Brahmin named Kondamana to fund his ritual service of a god, Malapali. The grant includes, quote unquote, all exemptions, including no entry by officers, Abhatta Pavesa. Another inscription added on the same pillar around 330 by a Kadamba king reaffirms the gift of the 13 villages to support the rites performed for the deity. The earliest Pallava inscriptions, also from the south, employ the same exemption formulas. In the Maida Volu plates of around 305 CE and the Alavakonda plates from a few decades later, the practice of endowing Brahmin ritual services is apparently well enough recognized that the record refers in a sweeping fashion to quote unquote, all exemptions of Brahmadeyas and these and all other rules for all Brahmadeyas, uh, they, for, for all uh, uh, Brahmadeyas, yeah. This suggests that for the Pallavas, this was a quite well-known arrangement. The precise functions of the class of person designated by the word Bhatta or Bhada uh, in these, uh, the, say, not to be entered by uh, royal officers in the slide, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in this first record that I have in the slide of Sri Satakarni, it just says not to be entered, but in uh, subsequent uh, records, the word bhatta or barda in, in uh, Prakrit is used, and later on, chata bhatta, uh, uh, two, two, two words. The, the exact reference of these words is not altogether clear. In later inscriptions, it is paired with chaka, also poorly understood. Both terms have frequently, if inconclusively, uh, uh, been discussed, but from context, it becomes apparent that they designate some sorts of low level uh, royal servants who were regarded as a nuisance or a source of oppression by ordinary citizens because they imposed themselves on pro private property in some way for example, in policing or tax collection. The fact that they are classed together with money lenders in one charter suggests that, they're, that demanding money or enforcement of other obligations may indeed have been involved. In later centuries, it is more common, uh, it is often used in the compound Chattabhata, which also occurs in lists of those to whom the royal orders are themselves addressed at the end of a roster of all the king's men or dependents of the king, Raja Pado Pajivina. But preceding the list of regular inhabitants. So we see them uh, somewhere in the uh, lower levels of public administration or public enforcement. The Hirahari Gali uh, grant of 338 lists several special exemptions as examples of a larger set of 18. So now we see the list uh, of, of these pariharas expanding. Instructions to exempt and cause others to exempt the property from such obligations is a new formulaic feature. That is say the pairing of the simple verb and the causative form of the verb to exempt, which will become a regular feature of the legalese of these charters. Another new element in the Pallava plates is the inclusion of uh, penalties for those who might violate the terms of the grant. This section comes uh, later comes to include not only immediate penalties imposed by the king, but also, and often exclusively, imprecations threatening 
repercussions in the next life on account of the sin that would be incurred by anyone who violates the terms of the grant. In Indian land grants, this function uh, is served by admonitory stanzas found already in the Gunapadeya uh, Charter of Queen Charu Devi and in the Alavakonda grant, both of which, interestingly, quote the Sanskrit curse stanza at the end in an otherwise Prakrit record. Some scholars continue to attribute to the Gupta dynasty itself the main impetus for the practice of kings issuing land charter grants, <clears throat> uh, land grant charters, even though no such charters were issued directly in the names in the in the names of Gupta kings, apart from two uh, that have been uh, agreed to be uh, later forgeries. As we have seen, the practice was already well established much earlier, and that, if anything, the Pallavas and the Shalankayanas in the south embraced the practice before their northern contemporaries. In fact, as I noted, the basic idea of tax exemption on religious grounds and separately of gifting of property to religious professionals, these separate elements at least, are both attested in the Mauryan inscriptions of the mid third century BCE. A long time gap ensues then before the first surviving examples of full-fledged land grant charters, those of the Kshaharatas and uh, Satavahanas, but these records themselves suggest that the institution was even then already well known. That, uh, that format, the format then continues to be expanded and elaborated in following centuries. DC Sarkar compiled a 20 page list of exemption clauses as they occur in Sanskrit and Prakrit charters. Uh, and the next two slides here, uh, uh, in the next two slides, I've attempted to uh, <laughs> boil that 20 page list down to two slides, uh, just uh, giving sort of general categories of such uh, grants. So you've got immunity from intrusion by various officers, chattas and buttas are, are uh, often at the list, but later lists also include Rajapado Pajivina, Jeevans, uh, and diverse specifically named officers as well. Um, exemption from the obligation to provide lodgings, food, fodder, other materials, draft animals. Already many of these occurred in those uh, earliest uh, Satavahana uh, Sata records. Exemption from payment of tax or other financial obligations. Exemption from the obligation to provide vishti, uh, or corvée uh, is the European term, as compulsory labor. Exemption from the rule of escheat, that means uh, this is usually just aputraka, uh, meaning if you die without a son, does the king get to take your property? So that would be the normal rule. It's actually uh, mentioned in the Dharma Shastras, but in these records, this is a privilege, special privilege is given that that will not happen. Uh, rights to control or use of natural resources uh, on the property, rights to plant certain sorts of <laughs> trees, uh, fruit trees, nut trees, uh, the rights to build property. These are, this is the sort of from the full list uh, that one finds uh, in the longer list that one finds in later records. And finally, I want to draw attention to uh, some factors that uh, often are included in these lists exemption from uh, the juridical or some degree of the juridical authority of the state, stipulated in terms of uh, parada, that the beneficiaries of the grant will have the right over to, uh, they'll have authority over the 10 sins or the 10 uh, crimes for the, they will have authority over catching of thieves or of applying uh, fines. <clears throat> Uh, okay. Inhabitants of donated villages thus appear to have come under the jurisdiction of the beneficiaries of the grants. Obligations formerly owed to the king or to other political authority would henceforth be directed to the Brahmin group or temple in perpetuity. Although the do documents themselves do, do, don't go into more detail about this juridical autonomy, the intent may have been to acknowledge that the religious groups were not only competent in matters of law, but that it was the a proper, for, uh, 
proper for them to control their own jurisdiction. What justified arrangements of this sort? What was it about the status of Buddhist monks or Brahmins that could motivate a prince to forego fiscal revenue, to set limits on state prerogatives, and even to yield the scepter of justice, the danda, uh, to a certain subset of the populace? What laws define such a status uh, uh, that would merit uh, these special provisions? We know from other sources, and those other sources are normative texts, that the religious institutions mentioned here had by this time developed substantive and procedural laws for their internal governance, the Brahmins, Dharma Shastras, and the Buddhist Vinaya. These codes were compiled on sacred authority, articulated by human beings, but, so they claimed, ultimately on a basis beyond mere human knowledge and convention. The jurisdiction of these laws extended to all those ritually consecrated in accordance with them, regardless of country or kingdom. In a few places, the rule books take some notice of regional variations, but emphasize the uh, greater authority of generally applicable rules on account of their transcendent origin. Brahmanical Dharma Shastra, the doctrine on Dharma, was developed by Brahmin theorists who, for their part, coordinated the two spheres by subordinating all forms of worldly law, which included the customary rules of clan, village, and, and region, as well as the sovereign decree of the king, subordinating all of that wor worldly law to the higher law, a higher law of Dharma, on which only learned Brahmins were deemed competent to speak. They accomplished this by tucking all the rules of criminal just justice and adjudication of civil disputes, otherwise known to us from the Arthashastra, into the chapters on Raja Dharma, the duties of the king in accordance with Dharma. Provisions are made in these codes to, divine, to define duties, capacities, and standards of conduct to provide mechanisms for resolving disputes and for punishing those who commit infractions. The Dharma Shastras, which aspire, like the canon law of medieval Europe, to regulate every aspect of society, propose two parallel and occasionally overlapping regimes of legal remedies, penances, prayaschitta, and, so, and social sanctions that are uh, connected with uh, the, the, the sinfulness of the acts for violations of ritual norms and, and for what we might call ecclesiastical discipline and fines and punishments, danda, to be imposed by the king or representative of the court. <clears throat> and just as Buddhist scriptures endorsed a practice of monasteries accepting and managing the donation, managing donations of permanent endowment invested for its maintenance and for provision of the monks, Brahmanical normative texts recommend that kings give land grants to Brahmins. Uh, and you see here a couple passages from Arthashastra and Manu that do that. In both the Buddhist and Brahmanical cases, the texts validate an already current practice with authoritative normative statements. When we hear kings and their spokesmen speaking in their own voices, as we do in the inscriptions, we do hear some broad endorsement of Brahmanical ideals of divine law, dharma writ large, especially in the ornate panegyrics, the ornate eulogies of sovereign power and the royal lineage that introduce the more prosaic technical te uh, legal, legal technicalities of the decrees. But it's striking that the, the technical portions themselves tend to classify people in different terms than those of Dharma Shastra. Inscriptions show that these statuses were also recognized in the political orders of wider society and could form the basis for assigning special rights, protections, and privileges by royal decree or council decision. Although such exemptions were conferred by decree and recorded in documents, their legitimacy and value were often justified in terms that echo the sacred law books. Now, so far I've focused on the implications of these foundation charters in general. Such grants presupposed that the beneficiaries merited support on the basis of their status as ordained members of a religious profession. 
as a consequence of that status. They were capable of performing duties and performing ritual services. Because celibate mendicants were expected to renounce worldly aspirations and material pursuits, the financial support would allow them to subsist while devoting their energies wholly to pious activities. Moreover, the very act of giving alms to them was itself supposed to yield automatically a spiritual or other worldly benefit for the donor or the donor's family. And this merit or punya was thought to accrue precisely because of the sacred status of the recipients. In the case of members of ascetic and monastic orders, mainly Buddhist, Jain, and uh, the uh, Buddhist and Jaina, the professional status was signaled by a formal ordination ceremony in which this conventional life of home and family were left behind. A rule of celibacy and austerity was adopted, including subsisting on alms. Members of such orders were identifiable by distinctive dress and accoutrements of their profession. They lived apart from the rest of society, having left home, pravrajita, living either in solitary residences or sanctuaries or living together in monasteries. Endowments made to mendicants or to monasteries, often in the name of the Buddha, designated the purposes of maintaining and repairing sacred structures, providing monks with robes and bowls for collecting alms and sustaining them in their activities of meditation and study. Brahmin status is different in many ways. Although modes of permanent celibate asceticism did come to be practiced by some Brahmins, who could thus be viewed as very similar to men celibate mendicants of the Buddhist chain or Jivaka persuasions, the vast majority of grants to Brahmins were made to non-celibates. <clears throat> Three centuries before Ushavadatta, the Buddhist emperor Ashoka Maurya, who praised the value of dharma sought by various religious groups and the merit to be earned by giving to Brahmins and ascetics, exempted the village where the Buddha had been born from making annual tribute payments, bali, uh, in recognition of its holiness. In the same breath, he, share, he, he set the share of agricultural produce owed at one eighth making the village Ashtabhagi, Attabhagya, <clears throat> which may have been a tax reduction. I mean, this sounds like he's setting a tax, but it may have been a tax reduction since the royal share most commonly cited, uh, albeit in later texts and inscrip inscriptions, is one sixth. So one eighth would actually be less than uh, the more commonly uh, uh, used one sixth. Uh, which the king earns by protect, uh, is supposed to earn by protecting his subjects. <clears throat> Using an analogous expression, the Artha Shastra exempted from customs and levies, uh, uh, exempted from customs levies, shulka, goods destined for Brahmanical ritual or sacramental uses. In other words, goods used in religious ceremonies are duty-free. The examples here are rites and sacraments of the Brahmanical religion, which naturally reflects the overall Brahmanical orientation of that work. A few centuries later, the late Gupta era Narada Dharma Shastra provides a similar list, uh, uh, provides a list of privileges that Brahmins should, be, should enjoy. The list begins with some tokens of dignity and liberties uh, regarding the gaining of sustenance. But it ends with three relating to river crossings that are quite interesting. Uh, and they're on this lower part of the uh, slide. Uh, this latter qualification underscores the fact that these privileges are predicated upon the Bra Bra Brahmin's status as a religious professional. If, however, the Brahmin is engaged in commercial, that is worldly activity, uh, an activity that Brahmins are only grudgingly and sometimes for, uh, and forbidden to follow um, according to their own normative texts. In such a case, the exemption doesn't apply. As we've already seen the, uh, in the oldest examples, Brahmadeyas, gifts to Brahmins, could be directly in the name of one or more individuals. By the middle of the first millennium, the lists of recipients could run into the hundreds or even in a few cases, the thousands. Or in the name of a deity comparable to endowments for monasteries being conferred upon the Buddha. 
Agrahara Brahmins lived in family households, producing offspring who inherited their property. The children of Brahmins were recognized as having Brahmin social status, uh, though numerous sources affirm that true Brahminhood was acquired through initiation, Upanayana, into a regimen of celibacy and Veda study called Brahmacharya or Vrata. Notionally con considered to re uh, require 12 years of study under a preceptor, an Acharya, a sort of sacred apprenticeship. It was this training that entitled someone to perform priestly functions and to teach others. In keeping with their vows, Brahmins uh, had to maintain ritual purity, which entailed a high degree of social separation, especially in matters of dining and choice of merit marital partners. The Apastamba Dharma Sutra and subsequent Dharma codes pitch a new notion of the rigorously rule-bound life of the pious householder as a form of discipline, as an ashram, uh, a word that uh, otherwise has associations with the ascetical life of a celibate mendicant, a shramana. Vedic ritual manuals had from the start pre prescribed often lavish honoraria, dakshina, to be paid by ritual sponsors to the priests who officiated at their rites. But from the middle of the first millennium BCE, other occasions were found for feeding invited Brahmins, either after uh, ancestor ceremonies, shraddha, or after offerings to the gods, in which case the feeding ceremony was supposed to increase the efficacy of the preceding ritual offerings. Uh, but also feeding of Brahmins began to be uh, promoted as a form of merit making in its own right. The larger the number of, uh, of Brahmins fed, the greater the benefit to the donor. One Buddhist scripture lists the same occasions for feeding Brahmins as, a, as those found in Brahmanical sources, shraddha offerings, sacrificial divine services, both domestic and uh, high cult, as say, shtalipaka and yajna, and the guest reception ceremony. The point of the passage is to challenge the validity of birth status as a basis for determining who, de who deserves to be ritually fed. This is just one of many Pali Buddhist suttas that subvert Vedic ritual norms by reformulating them in Buddhist terms. Another way in which this is done is to assert that the real value of the Brahmanical ritual lies not in the ritual offering its per se, but in the feeding that follows, provided that the recipients of the feeding uh, are truly meritorious. Was the feeding of Brahmins really seen as analogous to the feeding of monks? Ashoka had set these term, these groups already on a par in the mid third century BC, as we've seen, although the feeding or alms food are not specifically mentioned by him in the context of giving to ascetics and Brahmins. A more explicit clue to this rule, tacked on near the end of book three of Kautilya's treatise on polity, the Arthashastra, asserting that feeding Brahmins, uh, feeding Buddhist Shakya, uh, Ajivika or other non-Brahmanical mendicants in the context uh, uh, of offering rites is not merely incorrect by Brahmanical ritual norms, it's also a punishable crime. Uh, someone who feeds rabble recluses such as Shakyas and Ajivikas is uh, at, at uh, Shraddha rites uh, is due a fine of a hundred panas. The Yadnyavalkya Dharma Sutra adopts a similar rule, as you see here. <clears throat> the very existence of such rules reveals that many householders of the period must have been inclined to view Bra uh, Brahmins and non-Brahmanical mendicants as functionally interchangeable for the purpose of merit-making ritual feeding. It was on the authority of such doctrinal views that kings made endowments of land or of cash to create Brahmin enclaves called agrahara. These settlements of Brahmin families were supported by revenue from agricultural land and or attached villages. The stated purposes of the grants was to support the study of Vedic scriptures and scholastic works and the performance of Vedic rites such as bali charu satra or ritual service of a shrine deity 
in a devakula or devalaya, and and uh, and or the periodic feeding of Brahmins, sometimes also the poor in general, in a special hall of merit, a punyashala. Early examples that mention feeding of Brahmins include the Kushana, Central Asian, King Kuvishka's permanent endowment at Mathura in the year 155, invested with a merchant guild to support the feeding of the poor and the monthly feeding of 100 Brahmins. Grants to Brahmins are made to support scriptural, were made to support scriptural study and ritual performances, as we've seen. Exactly in the case, uh, as in the case of grants to mendicants and monasteries, grants to Brahmins and temples were offered in the hopes of earning merit in this world and the next. Yet the donors had worldly objectives as well in mind. A number of charters treat the grant as a reward for beneficiaries to, to, as a reward for the beneficiaries who had performed rites of blessing, swastiyana, punyaharachana, or appeasement, pacification of inauspicious forces through rites of shanti. Services particularly valued by kings in ensuring their success in war and politics. Um, th this is a, uh, a topic that has been uh, uh, the object of a book by Marco Gesslani uh, a couple of years ago. It's not rare that individuals named as beneficiaries in a Brahmadeya also appear, also show up as officials in the king's administration, which suggests that the Agrahara enclave was not viewed solely as a site of spiritual or metaphysical inquiry. The skills and training acquired there were viewed as having worldly applications as well. Patronage of this sort acknowledged a sacred sphere conceptually distinguishable from worldly affairs, even if it can be implicated in those affairs. Individuals and institutions inhabiting this protected sphere could and did participate in worldly, laukika, financial and commercial transactions. And the inscription certainly showed that there was no separation of church and state in the sense of a mutual neutrality. But ancient and medieval documents show that religious individuals, groups, and institutions could claim and were often accorded a large measure of autonomy and financial independence from secular authorities, autonomy that was legally defined and protected. This autonomy was granted in recognition of scriptural learning and to support ritual practice, and it was available to Brahmins of various sectarian persuasions, Buddhists, James and others on the understanding that these were all comparable forms of Dhamma, of Dharma. Civil religion in ancient India then, as in the modern world, it was a balancing act of granting a special separateness of religion, that is its transcendence, while acknowledging its role in securing the public welfare or the private welfare of the donor, that is its imminence. The real world political and economic implications of the widespread increase in the number of religious foundations has been a matter of debate among historians. One camp viewed it as a long-term drain on resources and power, tending to weaken central authority. An opposing school of thought reached the opposite conclusion, arguing that such land grants were in reality a productive tool for opening up undeveloped areas for settlement in agricultural production, and for social integration of often of diverse groups and tribes under a stabilizing ideology and ethical order and for state formation. In his review of earlier scholarship on the effects of Frankish immunities on public authorities in early medieval Europe, Paul Foraker warns against conflating general immunity from legally constituted power of the state and special exemptions. Uh, and religious grants with, gr with grants to lay people. In India, texts and later formularies do provide for land grants and tax exemption for secular beneficiaries. That is, for example, in, as, uh, in rewards for service to the state. But unlike the religious grants, these are never made in perpetuity and they were normally revocable and lasted only for the lifetime of the recipient. Paul Foraker points to a similar distinction in the Frankish cases. Turning back to the South Asian records, we can see that Agraharas, despite their exemptions, did not constitute fully autonomous polities that might challenge the power of the state. 
One charter, for instance, of the Maitaka ruler Druvasena I was issued to a Brahmin in 536 CE, quote, from the victory camp situated at the Agrahara of Kamalaniya, which implies that the endowed property was treated as part of the royal realm. Rather, although the documents frame the grants as gifts made by the gracious act, the Anugraha of the sovereign or of a member of the royal family, they may be understood as creating an implicitly contractual relation between the religious beneficiaries and the donor. The property conveyed from Brahmin father to son provided the heir was, uh, uh, was qualified, that is meritorious in theory anyway, uh, if the stated purpose of the grant was to support performance of rights and studies, it was conceivable that egregious deficiencies in, the, in performance could result in forfeiture. Moreover, although the grants seemed to empower and enrich the beneficiaries, their special status was limited also by certain factors. First and foremost, they relied on the state to continue to recognize and defend the privileges conferred to prevent officials from making demands to defend the foundation from thieves and usurpers. Hence the threats of punishment during the king's reign and otherworldly re retribution in future generations. The record has preserved instances of endowments being reconfirmed after an actual challenge or an actual us usurpation or replaced, swapping out old land or village for new or reassigning uh, the, the grant. There are also examples of regifting property. Speaking uh, of comparable monastic exemptions in early medieval Europe, which protected the property's privileges and internal autonomy of monasteries, Chris Wickham and Timothy Reuter observe that religious exemptions of this sort should not be seen as an infringement of royal or lay authority. Rather, they are the exception <laughs> that proves the rule of sovereign power. What, what Four Acre says of Frankish immunities applies to the Indian charters equally well. The beneficiaries, quote, increase in power over property and claims and clients was a far cry from weakening of public authority, if for no other reason than, it, than that those who received the privilege were amongst the most enthusiastic supporters of that authority. Which they, were called, which they called upon to protect their property precisely via requests for confirmation of the privileges of immunity. We have seen that Brahmin foundations and monastic foundations were not only parallel in many ways, they were also perceived to be so in antiquity. Kings, regardless of their personal sectarian allegiances, often distributed their favors across multiple traditions. Some charters even combine grants to Buddhists and Brahmins in the same document. And in this uh, Pala charter, Brahmins receive a grant in the name of, a Buddha, of the Buddha. The parallelism between Brahmins and a priestly caste, as a priestly caste, and monastic orders depended on the notion that despite having family relations and maintaining households, Brahmins were still perceived was constituting what we would call a religious profession. The males underwent an initiation that shared many features with the monastic ordination ceremonies. They were supposed to observe uh, strict vows and undergo specialized training under a preceptor. Even after marriage, their household life was represented as a sort of ascetical discipline, a grihasta ashrama. And they resided in enclaves set apart from the rest of society. The aim of many Brahmin endowment charters was to provide lands and revenue to support the enclave on terms nearly identical with those with which monasteries were endowed. <clears throat> Yet for all the analogies, the Brahmin enclave differed fundamentally from the Buddhist or Jain monastery. The Agrahara contained whole families with children. The properties and the app appertaining rights were inherited from generation to generation in, in accordance with the terms of the charters. And I mentioned that it was in theory, they could be revoked if the children didn't live up to standards, but in practice, as probably rarely happened. Uh, the result is that a sacred religious status, a sacred professional status became conflated and virtually indistinguishable from 
an inherited social status conferred by birth. Being born into a Brahmin family entailed certain privileges and perquisites that were legitimated on the grounds of sacred function and divine appointment attached to the class as a whole, even to those members who had not yet, and perhaps never would, undergo initiation and training, even to those members uh, who uh, never did, provided that they, of course, that they did nothing to result in degradation and loss of Brahmin status through ostracism. The legal mechanism of the uh, religious function of the religious foundation thus became an instrument for institutionalizing the privileged status which Brahmin doctrinists had been claiming all along in their own normative and narrative texts. This institutional element through the prestige of kingship and the power of ancient and medieval royal states behind a theologically grounded claim of preordained sanctity applying to a whole class of people. It is a case of royal decree, not just adopting the conceits of priestly doctrine, but building it into a systematic policy. This substantially reinforced a conceptual slippage between Brahman by birth, Jati Brahmana, and ideal Brahman, or Brahman by virtue, the Dharmika Brahman, or Shrotriya, or Snataka Brahman, whose virtuosic erudition or scrupulous ritual piety was the badge of his worthiness. In this way, all Brahmins, regardless of personal merit, shared collectively in the privileges claimed by scriptural tradition and given, and they were given public state recognition in the endowment charter. Speaking in broad terms about law in Euro-American context, Jack Balkin has observed, quote unquote, <clears throat> although the legal status of individuals and the sociological status of groups are distinct concepts, Law often directly reflects social status and helps preserve status markers. And sometimes law helps constitute hierarchies of social status directly. Legal categories can map status distinctions and help to constitute them. The foundation charters that we've examined here provide textbook examples of this phenomenon from ancient and early medieval India. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lubin, for that uh, excellent presentation, which uh, took us through something which, with which we are familiar. But at the same time, you provided very uh, interesting and fresh insights into the theme. So thank you for that. Um, before opening up for uh, brief comments and questions from the audience, we'll probably be able to take a couple of questions at best. Um, I just would like to flag some of the issues that you have raised. Um, I think one of the things that uh, emerged from your presentation, and which would be ex extremely valuable for us to keep in mind, is that you reminded us of the need to look at the long history of the land grants, rather than assume that these are something which began from the Gupta period over central to the Gupta period. And I think that that uh, decentering of the Gupta period that you have focused on is something which is, uh, it's useful to be reminded of that, even as um, you and other scholars have pointed, uh, drawn our attention to that earlier. And to look at the long history from the Ashokan inscriptions onwards to the Satvahanas and the Kadambas and Pallavas, it um, takes us to a different perspective and allows us to move out from the um, North India centered history that we are often very familiar with. So thank you very much for that. I think the other point which is um, very interesting about what you presented today uh, is this uh, question that you're raising about, um, about the ways in which you can have um, this uh, distinction between the professional and the other categories of Brahmanas. And I think that is something which is interesting and which would be useful to follow up. And uh, while I found the ways in which you are integrating the uh, parallels with the Buddhist tradition very, very interesting and challenging in some ways, again, a point that you have touched on, it would be worth looking at. 
and perhaps a little bit more carefully, is the distinction between a monastic order and one where you have um, a very central focus on continuity through reproduction. So what happens between the two? How far are, can we look at the similarities and what are the fundamental differences that are there? So that is one thing that I thought was uh, worth taking up. Um, and uh, while there are these parallels that are there between the Buddhist and the Brahmanical institutions that you have drawn attention to, uh, what would be the differences? Because there are obviously, there would be differences between the two. So what would be significant in that sense? And I was thinking that perhaps proportionately, if we look at the, again, this is impressionistic, at the uh, number of land grant inscriptions that we have, um, would we be correct in saying that the majority would be to Brahmanical institutions? rather than to the Buddhist or Jaina institutions. And especially when you have these long exemptions and the Dasha Paratha, et cetera, coming in, would they be more typical of the grants that are being made to Brahmanas? Or would we find them as commonly in the grants being made to Jainas and Buddhists uh, in the um, early medieval context? Because the Ajivikas tend to fade out after a point. They don't continue in the same. Oh, sorry, They're there only very early on. Yes, so I think that that is something which might be interesting to have a look at. Um, yes, and uh, the connections that you're making with the larger social universe um, are really something which one would like to know a little bit more about how, because you are making a distinction between the Brahmanas who are receiving the grants and the others because not all Brahmins would obviously be receiving grants. So how does their status impact on the, uh, the Brahmins who are not receiving grants, who may not, is there a degree of differentiation that comes in over there? Uh, and how would that operate? That would be something that would be perhaps interesting to think about. Um, also in passing, you made this, um, uh, you made an interesting reference to the fact that uh, you have these, um, references to uh, social categories in the Prakrit technical section of uh, some of the grants, which do not quite uh, match up with what you find in the um, Sanskritic portions in some ways, that there is a difference in the way in which the social world is visualized in the te technical sections of the grants as opposed to the other parts. So if there's something more that you would like to uh, discuss about that. And um, yeah, I think I leave it at that for the moment. And uh, I can see that there is uh, a very interesting question from Sumati, which is here, who is also talking about the scholarship of Troutman, Parry, and others who have argued that the purest Brahmin would not solicit gifts. And then, <coughs> so so what, what would happen in that context, as well as the uh, implication of the uh, grant in perpetuity. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think if you, if can you read the, or should I read it out for you? Um, well, uh, I'm uh, uh, Professor Lubin. Thank you for your illuminating talk. I have two unrelated questions. I'm thinking of a long tradition of scholarship, for example, Troutman, Paddy, and others who have argued that the purest Brahman did not solicit gifts and ideally did not or would not accept the gift. Pushed to the logical uh, extreme, the gift finds no recipient, shades of Derrida here. Do you have examples from your archives of Brahmins who refuse to accept Brahmadeya and did they offer reasons for their refusal? And part two of the question is regarding the in, per in perpetuity clause until the sun, the moon, etc. I wonder if your records show an equivalent of what comes to be called Cipre doct doctrine what happened to the grant if the original purpose became redundant? Could the beneficiaries' descendants repurpose the endowment? So uh, it's an interesting set of questions that are there for you. Very interesting. Would you like and to respond? I can respond quickly, uh, I think, to both, but maybe not very <laughs> thoroughly. Uh, I mean, in the first, I, there, there's a these statements that uh, tr purist Brahmins don't accept gifts um, is, is a sort of a theoretical ideal <laughs> more than an actual uh, practical 
uh, reality. Uh, I think what you do find some references, I mean, for instance, also Brahmanical texts often say that uh, ideally Brahmins should only be performing the rites on their own behalf. They shouldn't be using their services. I mean, they frame it in terms of selling the mantras or selling their services uh, to, uh, to other parties somehow is a uh, lower or even uh, uh, compromising, spiritually compromising activity. I think what these sorts of references, references, references do is that they uh, exhibit a certain anxiety within the tradition itself about the actual realities of life as a Brahmin. The fact of the matter is, is that if you are devoting as much yeah. time and energy to studying the Vedas and performing rites, there needs to be some income. Somebody sure. needs to be paying, paying the bills. And, uh, uh, but nevertheless, there, is no, there has been a perfect long-term persistent sense of unease uh, within the tradition about the necessity to receive money, let alone to act, ask for it. But I mean, there's no doubt if you, you know, both in the Brahmanical text and I mean, so these, the, that sort of reference is coming from uh, sort of the more, most theologically oriented <laughs> uh, texts within the traditions. Uh, but when you look at the Dharma Shastras, it's perfectly clear that uh, the, the off Brahmin authors of those texts addressing, uh, these texts are addressed to other Brahmins for the most part, you know, it's plainly clear that they understand the need for, to uh, make money, one, to, to acquire sustenance, subsistence, one way or the other. And then you've got the whole Appa Dharma notion that when things really get tough, you can even break some of the general rules, right? So yeah. that's an ideal the notion that the purest problem doesn't, but this is the thing, this is the larger point actually, uh, I think related to something uh, you, you were saying as well, uh, what about the Brahmins who weren't Agrahara Brahmins? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, they don't show up in our texts very much, yeah. right? I mean, you can't all, always yeah. tell. Uh, mm -hmm. Brahmins are sometimes mentioned in other contexts in the inscriptions, and we don't know uh, whether that's an Agra, like one of the ones I cited uh, from very early on, one of the very earliest ones, uh, I think it was uh, one of the Kshaharata ones, it says that Ushavadatta purchased land from mm -hmm. a Brahmin, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. you know, who was this Brahmin? Did, was it a Brahmin who'd received the land? Uh, theoretically, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Agrahara lands aren't supposed to be sold. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to be inalienable, but that just means that they've, they've passed down within the members of the Agrahara. Mm -hmm. And the Putraka rule, that the land can't be subject to Eschi, just means that if a Brahmin within mm -hmm. that community dies without offspring, the king doesn't get to seize mm -hmm. the land back, in theory. But this is all in theory. And we also, there are, there's plenty of evidence from the inscriptional record itself that uh, the, the whole notion that these are, uh, this is addressing uh, Sumati's second question hmm. as well. The rhetoric is one of perpetual, in perpetuity. Hmm. In reality, it's clear that uh, these weren't always in perpetuity because many of the inscriptions, there are not a few, not a few inscriptions that uh, record some uh, beneficiaries coming and saying, this is supposed to be our land, it was taken away from us. <laughs> or, you know, demand, sometimes it's just a change of regime, right? So from the Kshaharatas to the Satavahanas, uh, part of what was going on there was basically the Satavahanas putting their own stamp, you know, demonstrating their authority by giving land by or re <laughs> reaffirming uh, earlier endowments. But sometimes these weren't reaffirmed, right? And that probably has to do with behind the scenes realities that don't show up in the documents at all. It's like, did that, was that community recalcitrant with regard to the new uh, political authority? Or did the new political authority simply have a different set of, uh, of supporters that they wanted to reward? Mm -hmm. So they, yeah. So, you know, even though we look at these inscriptions as being somewhat closer to practical realities than say Sanskrit or, or, mm -hmm. or just normative texts, 
nevertheless, there's still a lot going on behind the scenes, just as with legal documents and, 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 and policy statements of the government today. There's all kinds of stuff going on below the surface that you cannot, you can only either, is either completely invisible or can mm -hmm. only be dimly perceived by reading between the lines and comparing. Thank yeah, thank you. There's one more question, uh, which is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, who asked, thank you, Professor Lubin, for this comprehensive lecture. I was wondering if one can trace a tra trajectory of the relations these inscriptions or charters had with their intended audiences across the time in and beyond the scope of Dharma. Uh, the, I, there was a little bit of interference there. Okay, I'll just read it once more. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Lubin, for this comprehensive lecture. I was wondering if one can trace a trajectory of the relations these inscriptions or charters had with their intended audiences across the time in and beyond the scope of dharma. Okay, I'm, I'm not 100% sure I quite uh, grasp uh, what, what the uh, questioner is asking, but um, uh, the trajectory of uh, in and beyond the scope of Dharma. I mean, these were regarded, Dharma is the justification <laughs> for the documents themselves. Yes. Clearly that they were being created to, um, as a sort of permanent record, mm -hmm. as, uh, as having future evidentiary value. Um, in many cases, it seems, and perhaps in most cases, it seems that uh, the uh, that the copper plate grants, let's say, mm -hmm. if, if it was to a community of Brahmins, there's often copper plate grants. The copper plate grant was produced. the The original order is made on, you know, whatever palm leaf or uh, some perishable material that handed over that way. But the permanent record is there uh, to be stored away. You know, farmers are always digging them up in their fields because they were buried, they were stored away for such time that the rights in them would be challenged inevitably, right? Eventually, with the passage of time. The trajectory of them, I'm, I'm not exactly sure uh, if this is what the, the questioner is asking, but the, certainly the, the long term. Uh, 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 sort of destiny of these documents was to be produced mm -hmm. to defend a uh, claim of rights. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they were forged, right? Mm -hmm. uh, some copy may have been left, not necessarily a, a copper plate copy, but some sort of copy was being stored somewhere in an adhikarana, mm -hmm. in a government mm -hmm. office somewhere. Uh, the, uh, the, there was this huge horde of uh, copper plate grants from Valka, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which uh, are fairly early. And I think the hypothesis, Ramesh and Tiwari's uh, hypothesis there was that that may have, the horde may have consisted the government record office. <laughs> so in that case, they were holding on to them because at least one of those records refers to a, uh, a, a forgery, mm -hmm. a forged document. So, um, I mean, the documents themselves invoke Dharma, but they're very much practical, hmm. uh, worldly artifacts. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so I think uh, on that note, uh, we, we'll wind up and thank you very much on behalf of all of us. It was a pleasure to be, be present today. It was a great pleasure to, great pleasure to talk to you. Uh,